I stand before you today fully awake, but I dream the dream of Jesus, of Muhammad, of Gandhi, of Martin Luther King, and every spiritual and religious leader have come before us. Okay, have a dream. Okay, welcome to the second in the series of Spotlight on Faith, and I am luckily enough to be joined this week with by the Reverend Scott McKenna from the parish of St. Columba Church in Ayr. Correct. Just, just to get that correct there, of course, um, we knew each other when you were the minister at Mayfield Salisbury Church. Um, and uh, looking forward to, to, to catching up with you and asking you some questions around um, how you feel people are coping just now around uh, COVID-19 and the challenges that represents uh, for our faith. So, I mean, so first of all, the first question is around how can people keep strong in their faith during COVID-19 when there are so many people dying around them? Ian, it's a delight to see you. It's an absolute delight, absolute delight to see you. And of course, you were based in Mayfield Salisbury, still are based in Mayfield Salisbury, so I saw you very regularly. Um, I'm also delighted to see that you need a haircut as well. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, in terms of uh, coping into, um, as a person of faith um, in the midst of COVID-19, it's hard for everyone. And the novelty of lockdown is, has worn off. Um, and it's certainly, I think it's true that many people have needed to employ strategies. And uh, mm -hmm. whether you're a person of faith or not a person of faith, it's the same for everyone. You have to employ strategies to try and um, give yourself sort of mental strength as well as physical strength during this time. Mm -hmm. Lockdown, of course, is a very negative term. Mm -hmm. Suppose if one were to turn that around in a spiritual sense, you could say that it's solitude. Um, mm -hmm. And indeed, every it's good for every religious person or indeed any person to seek moments of solitude, moments which resource us. Um, and what we turn to those for turn to in those things for those that kind of strength could be different things. It might be music, it might be reading, it might be um, speaking to friends or seeing friends on Zoom or whatever, or a combination of all of these things. So it's hard for everyone across the board, I think. But we can use the solitude as a moment of um, enriching our faith or strengthening our faith. Um, and I've certainly been encouraging my people to do that uh, with some online resources, um, and whether that's reading or, um, uh, or, or you know, seeking meditations online. Um, and there are very good resources out there but that people can turn to to help nourish their faith. Uh, and it seems to me very, very important as a spiritual practice that we keep returning to God. We keep returning to God. And it's not a one-off thing in life. It requires, it is a constant thing, including in the midst of COVID-19, we must keep returning to God for nourishment. And we'll find it. But there's always that eternal question, isn't there, about uh, suffering and, and why suffering is allowed to exist. So when it comes to extreme situations like COVID-19, you have so many people saying, well, if God is all merciful and all, all compassionate, why are people so many innocent people being you know, made to suffer during this time. Sure. Um, I remember once we were um, in, a, in a classroom and, of course, the question of suffering came mm -hmm. up from, from the young people. Yeah. Um, and, and the important first thing one has to say in discussing with anyone about suffering is to say there are no good answers about this. Um, now, we all know, and, and many of us will have experienced, moments of growth through suffering. But we can never want suffering or invite it. And that's something I think that um, you know, the the fathers and mothers of the Christian faith, in a sense, you know, they do not encourage us to suffer. Um, and yet, I dare say, in some cases, uh, people have grown through the suffering. Um, but, I mean, why is there suffering? We just don't know the answer to that question at all. Um, and does, you know, is God, God is all loving for sure. And I'm absolutely sure all merciful, but I would say not all powerful. Um, you know, a word in Christian hymns often is omnipotent, mm. or in Christian doctrine is omnipotent, which is all powerful. I do not believe that God is all powerful. Um, I think it's fair to say that God is all loving mm. and that we can encounter God in and through suffering. Um, but 
I don't um, see God as all powerful. And I think it's also true that death um, is um, an integral part of creation. Uh, I preached a sermon a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. in, which was entitled Creation is Cruciform. In other words, death is an essential part of creation. It's part of the creative process of creation in order for um, organisms, more complex organisms to evolve, to emerge, there needs to constantly be death. Um, so death is part of uh, the nature of the universe. But I would say that it's possible to encounter God in and through that suffering. And that's where we discover the all loving, all merciful God. Yes, um, there's been some theology, of course, of the idea of uh, testing us. Um, and even if you look at the book of Job and how, where does that fit into your kind of outlook? So, um, I mean, I think we've always, always, always got to be very, very careful about anthropomorphism. In other words, projecting human qualities onto God. It's so easy to have images of the old man on a cloud uh, surrounded by angels and a beard and all that kind of thing, like Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel. Right. Um, and just as beautiful as that piece of art is, um, it, it, it damages the concept of God. The Hebrews, the ancient Hebrews, uh, would never have made such a mistake. God is always um, in the cloud, in the darkness, beyond definition, elusive, infinite. Um, and so it's important, it seems to me, that we get away from uh, images of God like that are like the old man on the cloud. And I think part of that um, might be behind things like God testing us. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I, I don't like that kind of language actually, as if God kind of, um, in a kind of manipulative way. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm just not, I'm not comfortable with that. I mean, I start, I come at God really as God is a lover, um, and I'm not sure a lover would test a lover I mean, in in, right. in that kind of That's almost just... malicious way. Um, I think we are tested through events, okay. but I'm cautious about God putting these tests in our way. Um, very cautious. Okay, okay. Um, how are you responding to the churches who are, in some parts of the world, have been reluctant to close or have been very slow to close, feeling, you know, again, if it, I guess it's similar, maybe a similar way that you respond to that question, but the idea that, you know, I have a strong faith, God will protect us. Therefore, you know, we can continue to come to church as normal. Sure. Um, I mean, I think that um, for me, it's a misunderstanding of, of faith and of God's relationship to the world. I don't like concepts of God where God intervenes in a crude sense like that. God will protect us in that way. Um, I prefer to speak of God as our interaction with God or our receptivity to God's presence. Um, about us becoming conscious of God's presence rather than God crudely interfering. And of course, in the, in the Gospels, the, Jesus faces temptations in the desert. One of those temptations that he faces is the devil says to him, if you throw yourself off this building, um, the angels will catch you and you will not be hurt. Mm. Um, and Jesus said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. This seems to me a spiritual test. Um, and that's what the churches who say, you know, we don't have to close. God will look after us. God will send his angels to protect us. And Jesus said, we mustn't do that. That's not how life works. That's not how it works. That's not how we encounter God. So there's a good biblical warrant for not doing that kind of thing. So do you never... <laughs> you know find challenges when, when these things are happening to to keep the strength in your faith i mean you you must especially when you when you in churches often you, you're having to perform lots of funerals probably around covid19 which is mm. must be extremely stressful as well there's another time where you where you feel you know where, where god where are you you know where are you here at this time and so um I certainly understand 
uh, people's suffering. Of that, there is no doubt. And it's been particularly bad because COVID-19 has prevented um, family members being with the loved one who is dying. That is extraordinarily painful. Um, and people not being allowed to the hospital bed or not being allowed in the nursing home mm. and the loved one has, a, has to some extent they feel very much died alone and, in, and, it's, and it's not a pleasant death. So um, that is particularly bad. Um, it's also uh, a sore, something, a, you know, a cause of soreness mm. that at funerals, um, numbers have been two people present or five people mm. present or 10 people present. And so friends and the extended family have simply not been able to be there to offer tactile support, mm. the, you know, the, uh, the embrace, the hug. Um, and that's just not been there. And that's also particularly sore. And it means that the bereaved person has not only had to endure the death of a loved one and the, the memory that the person has died to some extent alone, but also um, they're not comforted at the funeral either. And, they're all, and then they'll go back to lockdown. And so they're at home and all they've got to think about is, is, is that, and, and to a large extent, they're thinking about that on their own. Um, have you been able to, excruciatingly difficult very hard have you been able to 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 stream services are people being able to join to funeral services or so um i i haven't done it i mean i think it's principally done by the funeral directors as far as i understand okay. um i've done a number of funerals um which are obviously related to our current mm. situation um, and there have been um at least one family that i'm aware of which recorded the service so that they right. could then send the file to people um, in this country and abroad who were mm -hmm. unable to be present um, and and that's been and that's been fine and i know that some um uh, funeral directors have managed ha have been uh, recording services or, or broadcasting them for mm. those who are able to zoom in as it were um, and also as you'll have seen in edinburgh in fact mm. um, from purvis for example the firm that i dealt with a lot um, mm. They have encouraged people to 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 stand in the street you know right. when the coffin is leaving or to arrange for the coffin to go past the person's address you know the, the whole address so that um friends can gather and acknowledge and be in right. a sense be part of what it's is happening which shows the family that people do love them and care for mm. them and want to support them but you know can't be at the crematorium or the cemetery yeah, so these are these it's, these are painful times. Mm. That's a, a question I should know the answer to, but uh, I don't. Do all churches or, or some churches have memorial events for people who have passed? Because sure, I and I sure, it's... and certainly a lot of, um, uh, or at least a good number of people, you know, families for people who have died recently, in these circumstances, have asked if. Uh, we could have a memorial service in due course when that is possible right. and so um i think possibly it's a possibility that churches and perhaps mosques and others um will have a whole list of um a long yeah. list of yeah. memorial services um but uh, but the other side to that is it may be a very long time mm. before a service of any number can gather in a church sure. um if we are to maintain social distancing, particularly for people over 70 uh, who are vulnerable because of the immune system and so on, if, if those restrictions are in place until there's a vaccine, then, then I'm, I'm sad and sorry to say that a memorial service might be um, a long time away. Mm. Well, interestingly, I, I've just come from a, a, a meeting uh, discussing the uh, UK government guidelines that have just come out, mm. uh, looking at uh, opening places of worship in stages, I think yep. uh, you may have seen that this morning, uh, and they were talking about uh, the first stage being weddings yep. in June uh, to limited numbers, and of course that that itself is a quite a difficult thing. So, I mean, how do you how do you tell people? You know, you're open for one thing, but you're not open for something else. You're open for for weddings, well, that's but right. not for prayer, or, or not for prayer groups. Well, that's right, and also. Um, uh, Guidance, I haven't seen the, 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 the UK government guidance, but um, guidance from Germany to the mm. churches has required um, 
a deep clean of the sanctuary before and after every service of worship before and after every service of worship mm. um, now many of our people who are and in many churches many of the people are themselves over 70 yes yes um, no, very so big building something, yeah i mean doing something like a deep clean mm. is a very difficult thing to do yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and and to do an entire sanctuary yes yes i mean that it's i mean strange. that is that's a lot of work uh, so there are real practical problems there Mm, mm. um so i mean it must be it must be difficult trying to to give people comfort at this time i guess i'm, I'm speaking to to some of moms where they've been talking about obviously having to have phone calls or or, or doing prayers mm. gatherings by zoom mm. interesting i don't mm. know if some churches have, have done that they've gathered some of the family members together for for you know final yes. prayers i don't I, I guess it's not the same as final rights but no no sure no no sure and it, it yeah i mean i haven't done that myself but it certainly um there's a spectrum of things um you know which churches are doing across um you know across scotland across britain just trying different things in dif uh, to see what works mm. and what about in terms of people who are must be hard as well people who can't get to go and see loved ones who maybe in hospital or in care homes um, oh yes it's very sore it's very tearful i mean it's it's very sore and very tearful and um and families will never forget that mm. and um and it's also sore um you know where where the loved one has gone into hospital you know to get well and in actual fact they've caught the infection in hospital um or indeed they've caught the infection in um in in the nursing home and so the, the, the that's that's also difficult all of that and people will not forget those that's part that makes it more difficult in mm. terms of the healing process because uh, mm. they were not at the loved one's bedside so how, what role does does a minister have in these kind of situations how do you how do you give that sort of offer faith and support and comfort at that time it's difficult it must be it's very difficult um i mean in a sense um you're able to to some extent to I mean, I, you know you can meet in a garden meet a family in a garden at two right. two meters apart and providing the weather is very good and um and you can speak to them and be with them there right. um and obviously you can provide um conversation on phone and there's meditational supports and prayer supports online right. uh, i haven't seen any in the, in the church of scotland but certainly in england there are good chaplaincy material around uh, for to help people and of course it's always possible to contact the chaplain and um, because although i don't have access and the family don't have access but there are chaplains, healthcare chaplains. Um, mm, and so, for example, mm. when the that, that emergency hospital was set up in Glasgow, is it the Louisa Jordan? Mm, mm -hmm. um, there was a chaplaincy team set up um, on site, um, and so um, you know, so the, there are ways of, um, to some extent, contacting it and getting closer to a loved one, um, and the chaplains are there to help, um, and, and they're obviously on the inside of the hospital. Uh, which helps as well it's wonderful yeah i mean I, I was having some discussions with the people in the scottish government around trying to ensure that um, there are multi-faith um, elements to chaplaincy at this time yeah correct um, I'm, I'm sure i'm sure the louisa jordan one certainly and, was and, 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 and care homes has obviously been a gap and uh, yeah i'm trying to see what what can be done to address yeah. that because i think a lot of people are reconnecting with the faith yeah, at this time, as you would imagine, the end of life. It's very yeah, different. and there's certainly the resources I've seen in England from chaplaincy um, have been interfaith, um, right. and uh, some yeah. lovely mystical poems from Hafez and um, mm. and Rumi and that sort of thing, which is great. Right. Um, how, how I mean, going back again about this whole thing about, you can imagine in some churches when the, some congregations are quite elderly. Must be very traumatic for some ministers who must be doing, you know, they they could sensibly be doing quite a few funerals. Mm. How, how do you, you know, how do you kind of um, recover from that? I mean, who is there a support service that allows 
Ministers I mean, certainly, certainly um, the Church of Scotland, and I'm sure every denomination mm. has um, a pastoral support mechanism, um, uh, and we certainly have one in the Church of Scotland, um, mm. and ministers can certainly um, access that. Um, Do you have your own, would you access that, or would you have your own way of meditating? Um, so, well, I mean, in a sense, I have my own, um, in a sense, spiritual director, but also... Um, as in all ministry, uh, as in all ministry, um, it seems to me that uh, you have to keep uh, nurturing your faith um, yeah. because otherwise you just get burnt out. Um, and, and what do you have to offer in those circumstances? So it seems to me in regular parish ministry and also in this pandemic, uh, you must, must, must keep nurturing your faith. And um, I'm very interested in the, as you know, in the uh, mm. mystical tradition, yeah. and um, and in Ignatian spirituality right. and practicing the presence, um, and all of that is very, very important to me. And um, um, and reading scripture every day, um, and reading poetry, and, and just doing what I can uh, to nurture my faith. Um, and all of these things make a difference. Um, and you need those anyway, but you certainly need them uh, in these in these difficult times. Mm. That's great. That's that's really good to hear that. I think I think um, we all need to find a way to kind of keep keep our faith at at this time. It's good you you have you've, you have that system. Yeah, that and I I think yeah I think that I mean for me as as you know you've mm -hmm. probably heard me say this a hundred times, but I mean mm -hmm. scripture is a doorway into the divine and mm -hmm. and careful prayerful meditational reading of scripture for me is a moment of encounter and, and i certainly try and encourage my people to do that um and, and that is what spiritual resource is it truly is a solace um yeah that's that's wonderful to hear and uh, just before we conclude then do, do you have any message that you you might like to share with people at this time um I would encourage people to um, nourish their faith and however that's done, whether it's online, I mean, things like prayasyougo.org mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. excellent. Um, and I'm a great fan of Richard Rohr as well, um, the Franciscan. But, um, but one's reading um, mm -hmm. and also keep in touch with friends because we do get down. You Fed mm -hmm. upness <laughs> is a new word. And, uh, and we do get down and we do get slightly kind of depressed and flat. And of course, when you are in that frame of mind, suddenly um, your mental health can go in the sense that you think of all the bad things in your life and you think of all the things you're not good at. Mm. And so it can become a bit of a vicious circle and you need to try and break out of that and push back on that and, and focus on what is beautiful in your life. Um, and what has been and what is, um, even in the hardship. Um, I mean, well, I, you know, I've been reading recently George Herbert, the poet, and um, he talks about the sweetness. And should, and it was a wonderful metaphor for God, the sweetness. And we have to constantly find the sweetness uh, in life, whether that's listening to the birds or enjoying the sunshine or reading a Victorian novel or reading poems or reading scripture. You we have to kind of, you know, come at these things with a bit of energy and uh, discipline i think well well i think that's an inspiring way to to end i think uh, i'm going to be leaving here looking to for the sweetness in life and good experiencing the birds and and i think that see if there's any sun shining from outside <laughs> <That's> <laughs> really nice. bless, blessings, blessings to you to. and your family uh, blessings to you scott it's been wonderful to talk to you and uh, absolute tonic and uh hopefully we'll, 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 we'll get to see each other in the flesh and <laughs> excellent thank you. Ian, thank you very much thank you very much